Well, we are in a series of messages on the seven deadly sins. Today we're going to consider the sin of envy. Proverbs 14.30 gives us this warning. It says, A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. We're not to underestimate envy and what it can do to us. Now, this verse likens envy to a terrible disease. We, we might think of, a, of envy like the terrible disease of bone cancer that has the ability to just eat away at, at your structural framework to kind of undermine everything you are and, and ruin your life. And so we shouldn't underestimate envy. Say, well, I never envy. I don't have to worry about this one. Well, if it gets in, he says, it, it can make your bones rot. So what is envy? I know sometimes we use the word uh, jealousy in place of envy, and we think, you know, envy and jealousy are basically the same. Uh, but there really is a difference between the two. Um, actually, Scripture talks a whole lot more about jealousy than envy, but jealousy is when you have uh, someone that you love, something that you love, and then someone else comes along as a rival, and they threaten to take away that love that you have. And so we would be jealous of that person. They're a threat. They're a rival. We don't want to lose our love. Sometimes we think of a love triangle. You know, the Bible says that God is jealous of us, that God is jealous that there would be nothing or no one that would come along and take away the love that we have for the Lord away from him onto something else. And, of course, his jealousy is a holy jealousy. But envy, on the other hand, has... Um, a desire for what it doesn't have. Jealousy has, it doesn't want to lose it, but envy doesn't have it yet. It's like the boyfriend or the girlfriend that you didn't get, that, that you want. And, you know, there's really nothing off limits to envy. You can envy anything, and anyone. You can envy another person's possessions that, that you don't have, another person's standard of living that you don't enjoy. Uh, another person's job, another person's family, another person's personality or their talents or skills, abilities, uh, their status, their reputation that they have in the church or in, in the community. I mean, we can basically envy anything at any time. Now, you might say that that sounds a lot like covetousness. Well, I just want what somebody else has. But there is a difference not just between envy and jealousy. There is a difference between envy and covetousness. Well, I, I like their house. I like to have a house like them. I, I like their car. I like their truck. I wish I had a car or a truck like they have. I, I like their phone. I wish I had that phone. I, I like the clothes that they wear. I wish I had those clothes. See, covetousness is kind of like going to the restaurant and you're going to order and the person who orders in front of you, you say, yeah, I, I want that too. You know, basically is, I, I want what you have. It's all right that you have it, but I want it too. But envy, it's more than that. Envy is, I'm not happy that you have it, and I don't have it. And if I can't have it, then I don't want you to have it either. Now, one author defined envy as a grief for a neighbor's good. Another defined envy as feeling bitter when others have it better. You know, envy is really no fun because of how it makes us feel. It's like it, it causes us to have spiritual jaundice. You don't feel good when you have envy. And envy really plays a comparison game. Envy notices what others have that I don't have. Envy notices what other people are like, and I'm not like that. Envy says, well, they have that. Why don't, why don't I have that? Well, that, they're that kind of person. I'm not that kind of person. You know, the comparison game basically leaves us either feeling better or inferior. If, if we compare ourselves with others, and we think we're better than them, we come out on top, you know, whatever standard of evaluation you use, you feel better about yourself. But if you compare yourselves with others, and they seem to be coming out on top, you feel worse about yourself. You feel inferior about yourself. 
And we don't like to feel that way, that others are better than we are. It, it hurts our pride. And watch out when your pride gets hurt because envy shows up. When, when you play the comparison game, you'll be tempted to bring them down to your level. You know, they're better than you. They're better than me. They're better than me. So you'll be tempted to bring them down to your level so you don't feel bad about it. You'll look for their faults. You'll begin to be critical about them. You'll begin to say, well, well, they don't deserve to have it better than me. They don't deserve to have a better station in life than me. They, they had it given to them. They didn't have to work hard for that. They had it easy. Look at me. I have it so hard. I mean, they didn't have to work for all that. It just got handed to them. But look for me. I'm just scrapping along, and I still haven't got what I want and to be where they are. They're not deserving of it. They just put on a good show. If we really knew what they're like, you know, we can project on people what may or may not be true, and we start judging them and critical of them. If we really knew what they were like, they're not deserving of any of that. They're not a good person. It's all a show. You know, that's what the religious leaders did with Jesus. They became envious of him. And when they delivered over Jesus to Pilate, Pilate realized what was going on. In Matthew 27, 18, it says, For he, Pilate, knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. They were envious of the crowds that came out to hear Jesus. They were envious of his power to do those miracles. They didn't have that kind of power. How can he do that and not them? So what did they do? They found fault with him. They began to be critical of Jesus. Can you imagine being critical of God in the flesh? How, how do you find fault with God in the flesh? With the perfect representation of God in a, in a human form. I mean, how do you find fault? They did. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. He works on the Sabbath. He heals people on the Sabbath. He hangs out with all the deplorables. We would never hang out with those people. He, he doesn't fast. He doesn't make his disciples wash their hands according to kosher traditional rules like we've always done for centuries and centuries and centuries. He's working with the devil to trick people. I mean, how does he get all this power? He's not from God. He's working with the devil. He's a deceiver. See, that's what happens when we are envious of others. We begin to pick them apart, find fault with them, and bring them down to our level. Whenever you become critical of somebody and you're finding fault with them and you're looking at that, what's behind it? Envy. Right now my heart is envying. Well, he's not worthy of all that popularity and all that notoriety, and they're being eaten away at the time by their envy. Now, those who get stuck in this sin find themselves in a sinking sand pit, a, really a quagmire they cannot climb out of. For, for example, let's say you have a friend and you have an old coat in your closet. You've been wearing it for years and years. You know, I always notice this about every winter. It's like, I thought I had a nice coat, but then the new fashion comes out. And it's like the coat that I have is so way out of style. Maybe that's not you. That's just me. I'm kind of an old fuddy-duddy, right? So you notice your, your, your friend has this new coat, and you just, wow, that is a really cool coat. And, and they notice that you really like their coat. And you are envious about, well, where did they get a coat like that? That makes them look so cool. And you're feeling kind of put down by it, and they, they feel bad for you. So they say, you know what, here, they just take off their coat, and they give it to you. Here, you have it. So you're envious of them about their coat. And then you put on their coat and you start wearing their coat around and you feel so good about this. You feel so good about yourself. And then, you know, envy is like that quagmire. You're envying them for their coat. And now you find yourself envying them for their generosity. Well, why are they so good like that? Why, why would they be so generous? I mean, I'm not like that. I'm not giving things away to people who I think want my stuff. And... Well, it's not fair that they're like that, and I'm not. And we just find ourselves envy, envy, envy. Once envy starts, it doesn't know where to stop. And here's, here's the thing about envy. We will envy those that we are in close proximity to and those that we are similar to. You're not going to be envying the person who's on television. You know, m maybe some of us have delusional fantasies. You know, I'm going to be like that singer one day. I don't know. I'm going to be like that magician one day. You know, we're wowed by these shows. 
But we tend to envy those that we are in close proximity to, those that we are similar to. A couple examples. Genesis chapter 4, we have Cain envying Abel. For God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but he rejected Cain's sacrifice. So as brothers, they lived in close proximity to each other. And how did that make Cain feel when God approved of his brother Abel and his sacrifice? He felt rejected by God. He felt dejected by God. So in his envy, it's like he said, well, if I can't have it, he's not going to have it either. And so we know what he did. He went out and he murdered his brother. Terrible, terrible sin because of envy. We find in Genesis chapter 30 with uh, Rachel and Leah. It says, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. So Rachel envied her sister Leah because Leah could have children, but Rachel couldn't. And she gets very unreasonable with her husband, like he is the one who can make it happen. Like, you know, he's not in the place of God. And if, if she can't have children, then she can't feel good about herself. She doesn't feel like she measures up to where she needs to be. And so how does she feel about that? Well, there is envy. So envy tempts us to look at those who are in close proximity to ourselves or to those that we are similar to. So it's like at the cross country race, it's like somebody else gets a better time than you do. Somebody just right ahead of you. Well, I wanted that faster time. It's like the girl who got the guy to go to prom with her that you wanted to have go to prom with you. It's like the person that got the scholarship that you wanted. It's like the person who got the play part that you wanted. It's the farmer a section over who got the latest tractor or the newer combine, the best technology that you had your eye on, that you wanted, but you couldn't swing it. Well, it's not fair that they have it and I don't have it. It doesn't seem right. It's the coworker who gets that promotion, who gets that raise, and you're still stuck with the same wage, with the same position. It's like, it's not fair. I work just as hard, maybe harder than they do. A fable tells how Satan, his demons were trying to tempt a man of God in the Libyan desert. Try as they might, the demons could not get the man to sin. They tried everything. They, they tried seductions of the flesh, onslaughts of doubts and fears, but he, he, he was unmoved. He just was steadfast in his faith. He, he didn't go toward temptation. So they're really angry and upset, not knowing what to do. So Satan says, okay, boys, move over. I'll show you how to handle this. So Satan goes up to this man of God, and he whispers in his ear, your brother has just been made the church leader over Alexandria. And instantly, a malignant scowl clouded his face. You see, even pastors struggle with envy. Missionaries, we all struggle with this sin. We compare ourselves to somebody who we think has it better. So the way this temptation works is you won't find yourself envying, as I said, the person on TV is going to be the person that you're close proximity to or the person you're similar to in life. You know, one of the adverse things about this sin is how it makes us feel, how it affects us. Uh, you're going to suffer. If you get into the sin of envy, if you give into it, you are going to suffer. And usually the suffering is silent suffering. You're going you're to hide it to yourself. You're going to keep it to yourself. Because we know it's inappropriate for me to envy. It's wrong for me to look at others and look down on them and say, I should have what they have. They shouldn't have it. Even during the times of the New Testament and the Roman and the Greek cultures, they, they looked at this as a very serious sin. Even the, the ancient Greek writers wrote about this and stigmatized envy as something that you want to stay as far away from as you can because of its harmful effects in our communities. If you don't act it out, your envy on somebody, you will probably slander or gossip about them and hurt their reputation. So it's not a good thing to envy other people. Now we know it's not right to envy someone, so we suffer alone from it. 
we, we suffer in secret. Because if it got out, well, Pastor Joel is envious of the other church in town, of the other pastor in town. I mean, that would be humiliating for me to know that it got out that I was envying about that. That would be an embarrassment to me. You know, we can be tempted with envy. Why? The Lord has blessed us. We have comfortable lives. We have plenty of things. We probably have more than what we need. So why would envy be appealing to us? Why would we even be tempted by it? And I think it goes back to the comparison game. We, we, we look around at others, what they have, what they're doing, and we size ourselves up by that. As I said before, if we think we come out better, we feel better. If we come out worse, we feel worse by it. It doesn't seem fair that they're doing better than we are. So when we play the game, we open ourselves up to envy in comparison. comparison. So in Ecclesiastes 4.4, Solomon says, Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. That's a really interesting verse. All toil, all skill, and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. So why is it that you work so hard? Why is it that you work so hard to be good? Is it for God or is it out of envy? I'm trying to keep up with the Joneses or I'm trying to outdo the Joneses and make a name for myself. Isn't there a place for us to do the best we can in life? and leave the results up to God because ultimately he is sovereign? Somebody said, where there is no comparison, there is no envy. You know, we can be tempted to compare ourselves with others because we're not secure in who we are as a person. You know, I don't like who I am as a person. So we feel inferior to others. We feel like we have to prove ourselves to others. We feel like we have to, to get respect from others. And if we don't have that, then we can't feel good about ourselves. So in the movie Chariots of Fire, there, there are two competitors. There's Eric Liddell and Abraham, um, Harold Abrahams, and they compete in the 100-yard race. So in their very first race, Harold loses the race to Eric, and we find him sitting in the stands with his head in his hands, and he's crushed. And he tells his girlfriend, he says, if I can't win, I won't run. Isn't that interesting? If I can't win, I won't run. And yet, on the other hand, we, we hear Eric explaining to his sister that he feels God's pleasure when he runs. He didn't say, when I win, he said, when I run. He says, I love competition because competition spurs me on to do the very best I can do. But even if I don't win, he says, that's okay because I feel God's pleasure when I run. So Harold was basing his self-worth on the comparison game. If I don't come out on top, I can't feel good about myself. But Eric, conversely, was saying no. I don't care where I come out, just so I do my best. Now, we can be tempted to envy when we forget God's blessings and his goodness in our lives. And this takes us back to playing the comparison game. As we look at what others have, what, who, who other people are, we can forget about the good things that God has given us. We can forget about the good things that God has done for us and making us who we are. You know what? People in church, godly people, we can do this then. Go with me back to Psalm 73. We see this godly man, this godly man in Israel, he is tempted with the sin of envy. And though he knows God is good and God has been good to Israel, God has been good to him, he still is tempted by the sin of envy. Notice in Psalm 73, he says, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So as he looked around, yeah, God is good. 
I'm trying to keep my heart pure, trying to follow God. God is good. God is good. (laughs) But as he looked around at those who weren't following God and they had it better in life than he had, you know, based on material possessions, he began to envy that. He began to say, why, why don't I have it as good as them? Why, why am I afflicted? Why do I have to go through all the struggles and trials and tribulations that I go through? And it doesn't seem like they suffer at all. They just have it good. They have a good life. It doesn't seem to pay to follow God. So, verse 13, he says, All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. In other words, I'm, I'm ready to give up on following God. If I, I follow God and I keep my heart pure and he's not blessing me and rewarding me as good as so-and-so over here who doesn't follow God, then why should I keep following God? That's why he's saying back in verse 2 that my feet almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, falling off the path of following the Lord. So what can we do when we find that we are envying somebody else, envying their situation? We need to do what he did. Well, let's find out what he does. Obviously, first thing he does is he admits he has a problem with it. I mean, it's pretty hard for us to admit this sin. You know what? I've been envying so-and-so. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. No, it's not good. But if we just pretend like it's not happening, if we just kind of stuff it down there and we don't face it head on, it's going to stay there. We have to admit, I have a problem with this. I am tempted with this, and I am giving in to that temptation. I'm not resisting. I'm just giving in, and I'm envying. So what does he do with that? Well, notice in verse 16 and 17. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. So he didn't recover from this poor condition that he was in until he went before the Lord. And so coming before the Lord, he is admitting, I have this problem in my life. I am eaten up with envy. And what does the Lord do for him? The Lord helps him see, okay, you need the bigger picture here. You're looking at what's happening right now. You're not seeing what's going to happen down the road to those that you are envying. Notice in verses 18 and 19. He says, truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by tares. And over verse 27, for behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You shall put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. So he realized, you know what? These people that I'm envying, I wish I had all that stuff. I wish I had the life they have. He's realizing... They're not following the Lord, so their lives are going to be destroyed. What they have is not going to last. Either in this life they're going to be destroyed, or in the next life they are going to be away from God. They won't be with God. They won't be blessed. So why am I envying a person who is going to have that kind of end result? That is foolish for me to do that. So he came to realize that he was wanting the wrong things. He he should be wanting what the unsaved have if that's not what God wants for him. He had to realize what's more important than these material things is the Lord. And notice verse 25. He says, Whom whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. So he came to the point, you know what truly satisfies in life is not these things that I don't have that I feel like I need to have. Not what my unsaved friend over here has, what truly will satisfy my soul is God. That is an amazing statement. Whom have I in heaven but you, and there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Nothing on earth I desire besides you. Nothing on earth I desire besides you. That is an amazing thought. And that's the thought that got him out of the envy. So when we find ourselves disappointed that we don't have more of this world, it is a reminder that we are not loving the Lord like we should. We're not looking forward to our heavenly reward like we should, that God has provided for all of his children. He has promised this to us. So if we are envying the things of this world, it's an indicator that our focus is not where it needs to be, that our eyes are not on the Lord and what we have waiting for us with the Lord. 
That's what the saints of old did. We know in Hebrews chapter 11, we have the story of Abraham. Here's a guy who lived in a, in a tent all of his life. I mean, how many, how many of us would like to live in a tent all of our life? I mean, I mean, we were on vacation a while back with our kids, and they wanted to camp out. So we said, sure, you go camp out, and we will stay in the air-conditioned room. And they were going to camp out for multiple nights. And after the first night, they said, that's enough. Because we were down in Branson, Missouri, and it was like so hot and so humid down there. I mean, who would want to camp out for all of your life? Maybe some of us here would until you get to be adults, right? But it's not the most comfortable situation. And how could Abraham be content with that? Because God, he says, promised to him a, a city and a house, a foundation, something solid for him, not that tent. So he looked forward to that day. We're reminded of Moses, what led him to turn his back on the wealth of Egypt and the, 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 the sin there, the, the delights of sin for a season. What, what caused him to turn his back on that? I mean, why wouldn't you want to have the wealth of Egypt in the royal family and enjoy all the delights there? He said he suffered being mistreated with the people of God because he saw the reward that he had afterwards. So when we are tempted to envy, it's a reminder to get our eyes back on our heavenly inheritance that is ours, to remind ourselves that one day we will have that. We will share in that. That's what kept Abraham going. That's what kept Moses going. So we have to learn not to play the comparison game to feel good about ourselves. Our, our, our sense of self-worth, our, our sense of value should come not from how we compare with others, uh, but our relationship with the Lord. You know, God has made us to have a body. And this body that we have has many parts. And all those parts are working together to give you the life that you have. And for any of those parts not to work right will make your life harder. But think about your ears. If your ears got envious of your eyes and your ears said, you know, we're going to stop listening to certain people. We're going to start snubbing people. And your inner ear joined this, you know, mutiny, whatever you'd want to call it, and says, you know, we're, we're going to make this person feel like their life is just spinning out of control, out of balance. And they'll never be able to do what they need to do. I mean, if your, your ears didn't play their part and do how they're supposed to work and sabotage your life, I mean, that would make your life terrible. Every part has to work together for your body, for your life, to be the way God wants it to be. And it's the same way with you as a person. God has made you who you are with your unique personality, with your skills, with your abilities, with your temperament, with all that. And it's hard for us sometimes to accept ourselves because we keep playing the comparison game and we don't measure up. We're not as good as so-and-so. We're not like so-and-so in this area. And we see our differences. And it's hard for us as we see our differences to accept who we are. But God has made you the way he wants you to be. Just the way you are. And if you want to improve yourself, if you want to become a better person, it's not so that you're competing and becoming better than somebody else. It's so that you're becoming better so that you can serve better, so that you can serve your family better, so that you can serve in your church better, so that you can serve in the place where you work better. Not that you're competing and comparing. It's you're fine with how God made you. You see, God made you how you are. I know my kids, they said, Dad... I don't want to be as tall as you. Well, I have to be fine with how God made me. I don't know why he made me a skinny beanpole, but he did. And I have to be fine with that. I can't be comparing myself with some guy who's the Hulk. And say, well, I wish I could be like the Hulk. No, I'm never going to be like the Hulk. So if I'm never going to be like the Hulk, and I have to be like the Hulk to be happy with myself, I'm never going to be happy with myself, right? And we have to realize that God has made us the way we are because that's the way he wanted us to be. And he did it out of his love for us. He did it because that's just how he wants us to be for the relationship we have with him. And we can accept that and be secure in that and realize God has given me the life I have. 
So I'm not to be comparing myself. I'm not to be competing with others in that way. I'm to accept who I am. And I'm to rejoice in the relationship I have with God and say, I am secure in this. And when temptation comes and it tempts me to envy others who I think have it better, who are better than me, I say, no, I am who God made me to be. God made me this way because he loves me and he accepts me. And he wants my life to count. He wants me to play my part. And I can't play that part if I'm envying others. So we have to come to accept ourselves and have our self-worth in God, in our relationship with him. Now, some of you may remember uh, George Mueller. He was the fellow who started all those orphanages and Christian schools in England back in the 19th century. And he's an amazing man of faith. I mean, he would not tell anybody about the needs in the orphanages. And he would just tell God alone in prayer. And then some miraculous thing would happen and they would have a bill paid right at the last minute or they would have a milk truck break down in front of an orphanage and they would have breakfast for the kids that day when they didn't have any food. Amazing story of faith. Most of us probably don't know about George Mueller is that he was actually also a pastor in Bristol, England. He was a co-pastor. And the other pastor's name was Henry Craik. And what Mueller noticed about Pastor Craik was he was very gifted in his teaching ministry. He was so gifted, he noticed that the people in the church, they really liked Pastor Craig's teaching more than his teaching. They thought he was a better Bible teacher, a better expositor of God's word. He began to envy Pastor Craig. Well, why is he better than me? Why do they like him more than they like me as the teacher? And he realized that that was a sin shouldn't be that way. And so he confessed his sin to the Lord, and then he went and he confessed his sin to Pastor Craig, and he decided that he would say what John the Baptist said. John the Baptist said in uh, John, I believe it's John chapter 1, a person can receive nothing unless it is given him from heaven. Now John said that at a time when everybody seemed to be leaving him and going after Jesus. He says, I'm not going to be envious of Jesus. He says, I can't have anything unless God gives it to me. And so that's what uh, Pastor Mueller did. He said, God, I thank you for Pastor Craig. I thank you for giving him the teaching gift. I rejoice in his teaching gift. I rejoice in how you're using him in our church. And their friendship lasted 35 years until Pastor Craig passed away. And now had envy come and taken root in his heart and kept him in envy, that friendship would not have lasted. Because you can't be friends with somebody that you're envying. But thank God that he was able to get past that. And thank God that George Mueller has left us today a legacy of faith in God that God provides if we will just trust him and ask him. So we don't have to compare ourselves with others and base our self-worth on how we measure up. As Mueller did, we can see ourselves as uniquely created by God to fulfill his purpose for our lives as we play our part, we do our role. So because God has created you, you are special to God. He loves you. He accepts you through Christ. And so you are enough. You just have to accept what God accepts. So let's face it, we're, we're not going to measure up with others. God made us differently. But we can be secure because of God's love and acceptance of you. So when envy comes and tempts you to do the comparison game, we can say, no, I find my worth in my relationship with God and how he's created me, his love for me. So let me give you one more thing about envy, how we overcome envy. And this is going to be a little bit different than the comparison because I think so much of envy is based on comparison. We have to learn to cultivate love for others. I came across this poem by Victor Hugo, and it, the poem is on avarice, or we would call it greed, avarice and envy. He has avarice and envy as two identical twin sisters, except one's avarice and one's um, what we're talking about here with envy, and he has them walking along a path. And as they walk along, the only words that avarice can utter in a low, frightened mutter is, there's not enough, enough. 
yet in my store. And then Envy, as she scanned the glittering sight, groaned as she gnashed her yellow teeth with spite. She's more, more, still forever more. So as they go along, the two sisters come upon a genie of sorts. And the genie says to them, I will grant you with a wish. Whatever you wish, I will give to you with only one condition. Whatever you wish, the other gets a double portion of it. So, Avarice had a hard time making up her mind since whatever she wanted, Envy would get twice as much. And she couldn't imagine doing that. So, Envy breaks the silence with a smiling, malignant sneer upon her sister dear, who stood in expectation by. Ever implacable and cruel spoke, I would be blinded on one eye. You see, that's envy. Envy cannot love. Envy cannot love others. So to overcome envy, we have to break the comparison game and we have to learn to show love for others. Love for those that we might be envying. You know, I love the story in the Bible of Jonathan and David. You know, Jonathan is King Saul's son. He had every right to be envious, if anybody would be envious. Here's David from out of nowhere, the shepherd boy. Nobody knows of him. And he comes along and he, he kills Goliath and suddenly he is catapulted to the national limelight. I mean, here's Jonathan. He's King Saul's son. I mean, the path to the throne when Saul dies, it's obvious our next king is going to be Jonathan. There's no question. There's no debate about that. It's Jonathan. And yet here comes David. And it suddenly looks like David is going to become the rival Who's going to win? I mean, obviously we should go with David, right? Because of killing Goliath. But yet Jonathan is Saul's son and divine right of kings. He should be the king. And yet we read this in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 1. As soon as he, that's David, had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. They became best of friends by Jonathan's choice. I mean, David didn't have any claim to be best friends with the king's son, but yet Jonathan made him his best friend. And Jonathan had his back. He began to protect David because Saul became jealous of David. He tried to kill David, and Jonathan kept stepping in the way to save David's life. You know, had Jonathan chosen the path of envy, he really be could have become the poster child for envy, but he chose the path of love. For Jonathan to love David, that friendship that they had. So when, when you're tempted with envy, so maybe a friend, maybe a coworker, and you're envying them, you know it in your heart, you're, I'm envying them, I'm comparing, I'm wanting what they have, I don't think they should have it, you're envying, I'm judging them. How can I show love for them? Instead of envying them, what can I do to show love for them? So to do that, you're going to have to get to know them. That's relationship. And as you know people, as you share in your lives, you're going to come across their needs. And as you begin to meet those needs, that's love in action. You're doing something for them. Instead of envying them, you're replacing that envy with love. Well, some of our Christian predecessors believe envy is one of the most dangerous sins. Ancient authors believed it was what led Satan to tempt Adam and Eve in the garden. You see, Satan envied that God made our first parents in his own image. That was what Satan wanted. Satan wanted the image of God. He wanted to be in the place of God, and they got it, not me. So he had envy, and he's been using envy ever since to destroy mankind. So envy is deadly, as Proverbs 14.30 warns us. Envy makes the bones rot. So today, if God brought a person or a situation to mind that you've been envying, he wants you to know that that is not what he wants for you because that is not good for you. Instead, he wants you to find your love, your acceptance, your self-worth in him, how he's made you to be. And he wants you to show that love to others instead of envy. 
And you know, we need to help our kids learn this as well. There's so much unhealthy comparison in the world today that our kids are going to be beat up with this sin if we don't help them learn, hey, it's not about comparison. It's not about comparing yourself with others. It's about knowing who you are, becoming secure in who you are in Christ, and learning to use your spiritual gifts to help other people to make a difference in our world. You see, when we stop making the comparisons and we focus on using our spiritual gifts to serve others, God gives us great joy and contentment, and His peace, not envy, will control our hearts. Well, let's pray. Father God, we thank You that You've created us to have life. Lord, You've made us uniquely. Each one of us is different. And yet, Lord, You love each one of us and accept each one of us who is in Christ. So, Father, we thank you for this great gift that we have today. We call our lives. Lord, forgive us for envying others who we think have it better than us. Father, we pray that you would help us to overcome this sin so that our lives might count more for you, for your glory. We pray this in your name. Amen.